And what I want to kind of get in and talk to you guys about with today um, is, is that God is good. But I want to talk to you about relationship with God. Um, because, church, I believe that... I believe that throughout the ages, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest lies that are out there um, is that, that we have to prove ourselves to God, that we have to earn something from God. And I don't believe that that's a truth. I believe that salvation is a free gift, and we get it through faith by belief in Jesus Christ. And I believe that as we start in faith, that our walk is to continue in faith, from glory to glory. And I believe that a lot of times there, there are these ideologies that say, that say that you have to do all of these things, that you have to do this behavior modification to please God, as if I have so much power and sway that I'm in charge of God's mood. Come on. You guys remember the garden in Genesis 3? We're not turning there. I'm just going to give you a little highlights. We'll get somewhere in Scripture, so get those Bibles ready, all right? Like a, like a Wild West kind of Bible, Bible, Bible thing. <laughs> I just made it come. Okay, so anyhow, in Genesis 3, do you guys remember that God, God created Adam and he created Eve, and then he would walk with them in the garden? God, from the get-go, created humankind to be in relationship with, to come near to them as they came near to him. How cool is that? Furthermore, as that garden thing happened, remember when sin entered the garden and we had the whole fruit and the serpent and all that stuff? Jesus came, or God came into the garden and he calls out, where are you? Now, I'm claiming God knew where they were at. God knew what had happened. But I believe that God was calling out because he wanted to hear from them. He wanted them to openly Express to him what was going on. Why? Because God values and wants open, honest communication. He wants us to know him, but he wants to know us. And see, God's a, God's a gentleman. Yes, he knows who you are. He formed you. But he wants the invitation to come into my life and let me share what's inside of me. Let me break open for you, God, so that we can really do this thing together. And I, I'm starting to get this more and more because I'll tell you what, when I was holding, when I was holding that precious baby in my arms, and that's, that's often because I don't like to set her down, right? Um, and, and, and it's just so precious. And you're looking at this, this child that's, that's the fruit of, of, of you and your wife's love. And you just feel the love for that precious, precious baby. And you start thinking, you start thinking, how do I love this much now? Because see, that's the nature of love, is that love is limitless. Love continues to expand. When Jess came into our life, love expanded. When Cody came into our life, that's our son, love expanded. When Vivian, love expands because it's limitless. Because 1 John tells us God is love and there's no limits on God. In fact, the matter, as we, as we grow in God, we grow in our ability to love and to receive love. And I just want to encourage you, don't let a lie that love has limits, love has to be earned. I don't have enough love to go around in my workplace, in my home. Church, that is a lie straight from hell. God is love. There it is, limitless, and just lean into it. Hallelujah. Hey, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Oh man, God is good. He is, and he's in a good mood. <laughs> you know, I've heard so many people talk about how angry and mad God is. And I'm sorry, but God is not either. Either when Jesus said it was finished and God's wrath was poured out on sin, either he was lying or, or, or that's true. Now, my Bible says my God is not a liar. Come on now. Philippians 3, 10 is the verse that we want to kind of start with. This is kind of our jumping off point um, because this has kind of been, you ever have those verses that just start to like, you read it and you're like, oh, there's like more 
in that for me. And then you come back and you read it again. And then it starts like messing with your mind. And you're like, oh, okay, there's way more depth here. And sometimes it's like obscure verses. And you're like, man, God, you've got just a diamond mind within this verse. Um, And and this is kind of what I felt from this recently. Um, uh, So here's where we're at. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I just want to focus first on that I may know him. Uh, Because that started to become an even greater prayer for me recently. That I just want to know more of you, God. I I just want to know more of your nature, more of your character, more of who you are. And see, here's the really cool thing about God. God is always speaking. Jesus is the word, the word of God. The word is always going forth. God is always leaping into action from his holy dwelling place. But you know what happens sometimes because I'm not hearing God? Sometimes I I got my, anybody still have like a stereo in their car, right? You know how they have an FM and an AM dial? I, I feel like sometimes God speaks to me while I'm on an AM frequency and then I just stay there. And God's still talking, but because of, of, of what he said here, I, I just stay right here. And I don't seek out. I don't open up. I don't listen more. And sometimes I think we need to flip over to the FM station. We need to open ourselves up and see what God is doing right now. And I think that's a truth for a lot of churches. I think a lot of churches experience a revelation from God. And then you know what they do? They turn in on themselves and they continue to chase that experience over and over and over again. And then 50 years later, they're still eating the same stale manna that they had as through a revelation 50 years ago. And church, that's how a church dies. They stay right there and they never receive anything else from the Lord. But I believe that God is always speaking and I believe there's always more depth to know about him. And so that's kind of where we're going today. But I tell you one of the things that so often perverts our ability just to lean in and know God and that's religion. Now I want to clarify, I know we're Christians and that's our religion. You know, if you're filling out a form, it's like religion and you're like, oh, I'm a Christian. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about like a religiosity wherein we have all these rules and rigidity that block us from getting close to God. That those rules become how we relate to a God who's far away and angry if we mess up and break a rule. We're talking now about a God who's an ever-present help in time of trouble. We're talking about a God who says, as you draw near to me, I draw near to you. We're talking about a good father. But see, here's the, here's the dealio of life on this. If you, if you flip back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul had to deal with this very, very issue um, uh, several years ago. And so we want to kind of look into it uh, because I believe that... that Having the ability to have a personal relationship with God is such a blessing. Dude, it's off the chart, right? And and, and I'll be real with you, that's not always been how my walk with God has looked. Because, and and this is no fault of, of the church I grew into. I'm not throwing a stone at that. I'm saying this is a personal choice that I made. But growing up, it was a lot easier in my mind, I thought, just to just to practice behavior modification. Okay, I got a salvation experience through faith. But then it was all about me changing me to please God. So if, and that's how, that's, that, that was the barometer of my life. I had a good day if I felt like I was righteous that day. Come on, church. Either, Either I receive through faith and I walk out through faith. And as I grow in my knowledge of God, God just naturally burns things out of me. I don't have to put, that isn't the bullseye of my Christian walk. Let me change myself. If I'm doing that, if I'm attaining my righteousness through what I'm doing, that's self-righteousness. And that doesn't please God. God's like, I've paid it all. I am righteousness through Jesus Christ. You accept and you believe and you receive. 
See, and I had trouble with the receiving because I was like, no, I need to do, I need to do, I need to do, I need to do, I need to do. What do I need to do to please you, God? Because I had this whole whacked out vision of who God really was. I had this vision of this puppeteer who was angry and shooting fire at me instead of realizing that he was a good dad who really loved me and who really cared about me. And when I hold my baby in my arms and I feel so much love for them, God feels that way about me plus 10,000 infinity. And he feels that way about you. So any bless you. So any who. <laughs> it's good in or out of church. Um, Philippians 3.1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. I love that. Rejoice in the Lord. Just have a good time in God. Because you know what? Sometimes Christians get a bad rap because we look so glum. Yeah, hallelujah. But, but why do we look so glum? We look glum if we are steeped in religion. But when we are po poised in relationship with a God who's full of love and joyous, then you know what? There's nothing that can keep us down. Mm, come on, I, I, I got to keep going. I was, oof, I was feeling that one. All right, now it says, watch this. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Now, I'm going to claim this is pretty bold language. Um, the Apostle Paul is, is literally calling a group of people dogs, uh, which, you know, like, <laughs> um, man, some pastor does that for the, from the pulpit, and there's like a, a sea of offense uh, that goes off. Uh, but bless God, but we don't entertain a spirit of offense, so it's not, it's not applicable. Uh, but look out for those dogs. So he's using pretty harsh language about someone. Who's he using the language towards? Well, let's find out. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now let's talk about this for a second. So once Jesus died and resurrected, uh, this gospel started going out into the, into the Jewish community, right? Um, it was going out before, but now the gospel with the resurrection attached to it was going forth. And all of these, all of these Jewish converts were happening and it was amazing. And like you have these, these scriptures and acts where they're like 3,000 were added to the church in a day. And you're like, glory, that's awesome. You're like, that's like a Billy Graham crusade, but you know, in, in Jerusalem. Anyhow, what started to happen is after, is after the, the gospel went to the Jews, we see that, that God raised up individuals, Paul, Peter, different ones that also took the message to the Gentiles. Now, when the message went out to the Gentiles, the Gentiles were people who weren't Israelites. They weren't Jews, right? So they weren't practicing at the time Judaism. Well, what started to happen, there was this sect of people called Judaizers who believed that for those Gentiles to receive the gospel of Jesus, then they had to reach back into Old Testament, Testament, uh, Old Testament ceremonial laws and they applied to them. So they were saying, you have to be circumcised. Why? Because circumcision was a symbol of the covenant between God and Abraham that the Jews carried down the line. But Paul is very specifically saying, no, that's an Old Testament ceremonial law. That died at the cross. See, there's things that die at the cross and they come through the cross or are new at the cross. Ceremonial law was done with the cross. When Jesus' blood was shed on us, they're done, ceremonial law. It means I don't, have to, I don't have to wash 15 times before I come through that door, right? Because I'm cleansed in the blood. All right, so the apostle Paul is addressing this. Look at verse three. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. See, he also talked in Romans about how there's this circumcision of the heart now. Because, you know, you have, the, you have your heart, and the circumcision of the heart means that the sinful ickiness was cut away when you had salvation. Your heart's now new in Christ. And that's what he's referencing. And he says that through the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no, watch this, no confidence in the flesh. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, I'm so real about this faith thing and this grace thing with Jesus that I'm saying to you, do not put confidence in what you are doing to please God. Just accept that God is pleased with you. Get to know him, love on him, and love on your community. See, the Old Testament law wasn't bad. In fact, the matter, Jesus explained that the Old Testament law hinged on these two points, love God and love people. That aspect came through the cross, didn't it? 
We still love God and we still love people. Now, now watch this for just a second. Let's look at verse five because the apostle Paul is now gonna throw down some Holy Ghost smack on people because he's gonna show how much in the flesh he could be puffed up and lifted up, but he's gonna say, you know what? None of that really matters. Watch this. Circumcised, he's talking about himself. On the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he's listing off this, this, this list of how religiously he's really something. But I want you to watch this next verse because, oh, buddy, I had to, I had to have this moment, church. I had to have this moment because I was measuring who I was in God, but what I was doing to please God. And I tell you what, that was bondage, church. It, now, here's the thing. When I made that switch up here, it felt so much lighter. It didn't mean that I had a license to sin and I wanted to run up and be, and be just a wild, crazy hooganani. Actually, far from it. In fact, a matter, it helped me turn in to go deeper in the knowledge of God. Thank you, Jesus. But whatever, watch this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything, everything as loss because of, watch this, the surpassing worth of what? Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count everything as just rubbish against a relationship with my God. That's what's worth something. That's where it is, dude, right? But see, here, here's what we do. Let's look at this comparison. This is what, this is what programming and religion will do for us, uh, is it'll set up really nice walls and put on really good shackles and really try to hold us down in achieving a relationship with God. And how does it do it? Now, again, I always say this. These lists aren't comprehensive. These are just some aspects that we have time to talk about today. Religion, it's really big on using fear to control. It's really big about trying to oppress you with, if you do this or you do that, God's gonna be mad at you and he's gonna be angry. And so be fearful because he's so mean. 1 John four eighteen says, perfect love casts out fear. Because when there's fear, then judgment and punishment are reigning atop. But Jesus is like, that punishment has spilled out. That wrath of God has spilled out. I wanna encourage you that you can now just lean into relationship with God and realize God is for you. Who can be against me? God is with me. It's all good. But you know, this is what happens. You set up, you're trying to please God and you're scared that you're not gonna please him and you're just like, oh, and then you mess up. Oh, guilt and shame show up real good. And they're like, oh, feel guilty. Golly, you did that. That's, you're worthless. You're awful. Church, I want to throw out there thoughts that don't breed hope, I feel are orig have their origins in a lie. Thoughts that don't bring hope have their origins in a lie. But you know what God says? He says, forgiveness and freedom. That's what I'm giving to you. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and, and when, you're, when you're in this whole religious, listen, when you're in this religious circle of, I gotta, I gotta please him, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. You know what you end up being really good at? Not loving the lost, but judging the lost. Because you see all the things that they're not doing that you're also not doing. But I'm, 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 I know God, so I'm holy because of that. But I can judge them because they don't know him. Okay? It makes it really hard. I'm claiming it's really hard for a religious person to love the lost. And I really think people are God's heart. They're why we're here. And so, if not for anything else, 
let the Holy Spirit just tear down our strongholds of religion and just let us love the lost even better. Let us love our community even more. And, 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 and this doesn't, listen, this doesn't, this isn't a license to sin. It's just a license to be free to grow in relationship with God. Because every time I'm trying to obtain righteousness by what I'm doing is self-righteous. But I have righteousness through Christ Jesus and my faith in him. Now look at this. Now, when we're talking about getting real, getting open, getting honest with God, let's look at where God can take that. You guys have your Bibles. Go to Psalm 22. Let's go over there. Because remember David? He was the king of Israel uh, uh, in the OT uh, for a time. Really cool guy. God said that he's a man after my own heart. See, when we're, when we're Christians and when we're in relationship with God, it really does mean we're in relationship with God. You can tell him how you're thinking, how you're feeling, and just break open for him. It's really kind of a cool thing. He doesn't want you just to put on a face for him and say, yes, everything is good. Praise God. I love God. I, everything is good. Yes, I pray. And when everything is really not good and it's bad, you know what that is? That's just, just false, right? And see, as long as we keep up that false front with God, we can't open up for him to come in and minister to us. We can't give him our pain if we won't share it with him. Side note, God is not intimidated by your pain. Okay, so Psalm 22. I want to just share this real quick because it's, it's the reality of like what David would say when he was ministering unto God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Okay, so Opal, he was really getting real. And, and guess what? God wasn't offended, and he wasn't turned away from David because David was speaking how he felt in his heart. Now, as, as I like to say that as the psalm went on, the Holy Spirit could begin to answer him. Because by the end of it, he's saying, yet you are holy. And you know what I found out? It just, this is just me. I find out when I get honest with God, and I tell him how I'm feeling and what's happening, it's not too long that he doesn't show up and begin to answer those thoughts that I'm already saying. And see, <laughs> Romans 8 says he is no, Romans 2 says he's no respecter of persons. If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. If he'll do it for David, he'll do it for you. When you crack yourself open for him, he doesn't leave you alone. I am not alone. Come on now. Now here's, here's I wanna go one more step with this. So, so so yes, David was open and God wasn't afraid of his pain. In fact of matter, God's never afraid of your emotions. And to be honest with you, your emotions don't control his mood. Just yeah, I thank you Jesus, right? Uh, uh, but, uh, but you can be real and honest and, and he's big enough to handle it. Um, let me show you something. In the, book of, uh, in the book of Genesis, when Abraham is taking, um, he, him and Sarah, they end up having a son, Isaac, right? It's the son of promise. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, because uh, <laughs> my wife's name's promise, I always had a paw, it, it, not even applicable. Um, and this is, what the, what, this is what God asked him to do. He says, take your son up the mountain and you're gonna sacrifice him to me. Now, I want to show you something. Abraham's son, Isaac, that name means in Hebrew, laughter. Um, so it's, it's, it's like joy, right? And um, Abraham's taking his joy up the mountain. And I always have this image, this is a tough one on me, um, of, of them putting this altar together and stacking the wood. And then it even says that Abraham bound Isaac. And I think about myself in my life that there's been a lot of times that I'm a pretty joyous dude, but there's been times when sadness has bound my joy. I believe that there might even be people here today who are sitting here where their sadness has bound their joy. Now I wanna show you what happens when Abraham is on that mountain. Abraham's on the mountain, he's got Isaac bound, and then an angel of the Lord speaks to him. I wanna encourage you, no matter what season you're in, don't turn your heart away from God. Don't turn your ear from what he's speaking. Because in that moment, if Abraham would have turned his ear away from God, he would not have heard the angel of the Lord say, stay your hand. There's a ram in the bush. 
That is what you're going to sacrifice. Cut free your joy. What what does the psalm say? Uh, Mourning may last for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Church, I believe that there is a time for mourning. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for, for, for sadness. Ecclesiastes talks about it, right? But I believe if we camp there and we stay there and that is becomes our life, I believe that is not God's best for us. Last thing I want to hit on is that not only does God want you to be open and honest with him, I believe God loves it when we are open and honest and even show vulnerability with our community. Our pastor is so beautiful in this. He breaks himself open and he shares. He shares from his testimony of of what, what he has done and what God has brought him through. And that transparency is so inspiring. And you think about Jesus. Jesus was like this. You you, you look at John. When, When Lazarus died, Jesus wept in front of everyone. In the garden of Gethsemane, when he was like facing, he was facing the cross. He brings his, he brings his three, his three, James, uh, Peter, and John. And he says, stay and pray with me. He's asking them, he's openly telling them, hey, oh boy, could use some, some help right here. Stick with me. Church, I want to encourage you. Being vulnerable with people that love you is actually a way that we heal. It's a way that we receive hope and we receive that healing balm. And, and, and now I, I don't, I'm not saying, you know, we air out every little thing, you know, you have to know about every BM we have, right? It's all right. I, it doesn't bother me. I'm just saying we have a culture where we can be vulnerable and we can grow through it and that that's kingdom. You know, I said in the last message, kingdom is a family business. We are family. Would you guys stand with me? Man, I love you guys so much. And I believe that God has the best, his best for you. I wanna take just a little bit of time and pray for one another. Is that cool? Are you all right? Everybody still awake enough to pray for people? All right, good. Hey, will you grab hands with the person standing around you? There's a couple ways I wanna ask you guys to pray first, okay? Um, I, I want us to pray for people who are in a season where they're just shrouded in sadness. And and, and I'm gonna use this word hopeless, that's how they feel. So I just want us to pray over one another, let hope arise. In Psalm three, it says that, that God is the lifter of our heads. And I just wanna pray that God would begin to lift heads of people that feel hopeless right now. I also wanna ask you to pray for people who are just feeling numb where they just, they just don't even hardly feel anything. They just feel numb to God, numb in relationships, numb to people. And I just wanna ask us that we would just pray for our body, that just, just joy, just hope, just peace, just, just the love of God would just well up inside of us, that, that, that we would tear, the Holy Spirit would just begin to tear down those walls of numbness and let us just feel the tangible presence of an ever-present real God who loves us. And so church, I just want to invite you, just begin to pray. Just begin to lift up those petitions unto heaven. Also, as you're praying, if you get a word for the individual standing around you, a word that builds them up, that offers hope, I want to encourage you to share that with them. Speak to them as God reveals to you truth and identity about them. Speak that over them. See, when we hear our identity from our community, it builds us up. It strengthens us. It encourages us. And see, we need our community of believers speaking that identity because if we're not speaking it, then you know who is? The world and the enemy. And I'll guarantee you that's not going to originate in hope. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for our church. And we just release, we release presence right now, God. Holy Spirit, just minister as we pray. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for love just rising in our hearts. And we just say more of that. We thank you for hope. We thank you for right now that someone is realizing that this isn't a hopeless situation. That God is there. And as soon as he is there, there is hope. I thank you that we realize right now that we are not alone. Not only is God there, but our church is standing beside us. 
they are petitioning heaven with us and for us. Thank you, God. Church, I love you. I'm so honored to be able to speak here. I wanna encourage you to continue to pray. Remember, God is for you. He's in a good mood. He loves you. He is pleased. He's pleased with you through the blood of Jesus, man. And that's really a cool thing. You guys have a wonderful day. As you close out your prayer, you may leave. Make sure you love on some people and let them know that they are so cool and they are so awesome. And thank you, God.